Tyler's asking, can you use using without having to give the target a name? God, sorry, the quest Twitch chat is scrolling. Um, Rick and Twitch. Can you use using without having to give the target a name? Like using entity instead of using entity call entity. Um, maybe. I mean, I just didn't consider that to be very important. So there's no syntax for doing that yet. And I sort of want to work on, you know, major functionality, right? Uh, something like that. Um, probably comes a little later, like once we see what it's like to actually write programs uh, in this language, then if something chafes a lot, it's like, oh yeah, let's let's make it nicer. But, you know, right now I'm trying to focus on the big things. It was pretty complicated to get all this ASSOA stuff into the language, so um, that was enough for me for now, anyway. Someone's asking, is there a plan for assembly inlining? Yes. You'll be able to do that absolutely. You have to be able to do inline assembly language. Hint, hint, Microsoft, who took that out of their latest C++ compiler. Why use dot members for enums but not for structs? Because structs don't have any ancillary data that pollutes their namespace right now. And I don't think they will. And in fact, the dot members thing may become unnecessary later because maybe instead of looking in the namespace of the enum, if it's just as easy to look at like the metadata in the program about the enum struct and get that information there, um, like you would for introspection generally of all your data structures, then that enum's namespace wouldn't be polluted and we could get rid of that members thing. So um, I wanted to do it that way uh, just because What's a good place to leave? Let's leave it there. Just for something to look at. Um, <clears throat> I was in the middle of a sentence and I stopped the sentence. Um, I wanted to do it that way just because it was a good way to sort of stress my using thing and make sure it worked. Uh, but yeah. I'm going to try and get to the older questions first. How do you see the process going forward of allowing other people to play with the language or collaborate on the compiler? We'll do that at some point, but um, I, I don't quite feel like it's ready yet. You know, uh, it will be uh, eventually. I'm I'm very happy that people want to get it and play with it, but um, you know, I'd like to just lay down the core first so that it's actually a useful programming language for people. Um, as opposed to like something you that's incomplete that you could sort of play with but not really. Do I have plans to offer V tables as a language feature rather than self-rolling? I don't know. Uh, maybe if enough people want them and they're very useful and we haven't found a better way to do it. I want to look for a better way to do everything. I don't just want to go and do the C++ or you know, D way or the go way or whatever, I want to look at what kinds of problems do we have in the specific kind of software that we write for the kind of programming that those of us who write the hardest software know how to do, right? Because, um, you know, there's people in games who aren't solving very hard problems, they just want to get a game out or whatever, and so they don't care about all this stuff that I even talked about today, but for people who care about this stuff, what's the best way to do it? And um, I don't know what the best way to do it is, and I want to try and find out rather than copying something and then ending up with something that's mostly C++ but with some nicer syntax or whatever. I want to avoid that trap because a lot of languages fall into that trap. So the stuff that you saw today, for example, is not very much like what you have in other languages, and that's cool. Um, you know, for I'm seeing a lot of questions about what's the plan for the back end or how do you implement concurrency and stuff and just any I'm going to bias toward things that are on topic for today um, because a lot of the answers of questions is just like, oh, that's not done yet because there's just a lot of work to do and it'd be very boring if I say that 15 times. So on topic to this session will get priority.
what about an on-the-fly packing declaration for a scope that repacks the specified members into a new array and at scope's end assigns the results to the source data? That sounds really slow. If you want to do that, then maybe via some other facilities in the language you could build it, um, like code. Oh, you know, the other thing I mentioned is with all this VTable stuff, you kind of could generate most of that anyway, because uh, like I said before, you have compile time code generation, you know, so I, I didn't want to take it that far, but you could do that. So, you know, if you can use compile time code generation to do something like that feature that the question was just asked about, more power to you, but I, I don't really know that I want to encourage that. I don't want the grain of the language to encourage you to do all these slow data copies. I think if you want to do a data copy, you're very particular about how it happens and when it happens, and you don't want it to happen mystically and magically all the time, right? You don't want to end up with a lightweight version of the C++ horribleness where people are copying back and forth between standard string and care star implicitly, like whenever you pass arguments to functions and whatever, and you get this nightmare. And yeah, let's just not go that way. So, um, Someone's asking, how do nested SOA pointers work? Will it store the full 128 bits in the array? Um, if by nested SOA pointers you mean an SOA pointer in a struct, then that's also SOA. You allocated both of those memory blocks yourself. So the fact that you put an SOA pointer inside another thing means you want the memory not to be contiguous. You wouldn't have done it that way otherwise. Now, if it's not a pointer, if you just have like a struct, and then like say I've got a vector three inside this door, right? I've got like position vector three. Well, maybe I want this vector three to be x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z, right? Or maybe I want it to be x, 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 y, 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 z, 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 etc. Um, right now, <coughs> right now I do not provide a way to specify which. It would be kind of trivial to say like AOS vector three or SOA vector three, and I just haven't done that yet. Um, right now the default is this is going to be AOS. Uh, you know, um, the reason why I haven't done that yet is just because I feel like what I've done so far is complicated enough that I don't want to presume what is the right thing for stuff like that. I want to get into some real use cases and see what would actually be useful in those use cases. And so far, um, there haven't really been any real use cases because the functionality I just showed you was only finished this past weekend. So that invaders program is like the most sophisticated program that uses this functionality so far. So I'd like to have better use cases before really designing these finer points of things. Have I done any benchmarks? No. Um, benchmarks um, sort of should wait on a back end that is really tailored to this language anyway, which currently does not exist. Someone's asking, is there swizzling? Um, you can write a function that swizzles. Uh, if you mean, is there arbitrary repacking and stuff? Um, not currently. But in the same way that I could say struct SOA here, right? Maybe I can declare a, you know, my personal packing or whatever. And that's just a thing declared somewhere. Um, that would get into a little more complexity because you would have to say, well, what's the syntax for declaring a packing and what features does that need to have? Um, but it wouldn't add that much more complexity to the compiler than is already there because the SOA stuff is complex enough that letting you specify it more uh, in more detail would not add much more complexity. Actually, so remember how I had this vector3 uh, SOA array example? Where was that? So you could imagine that you want to be able to declare different things. So B being SOA vector threes, 
let's say this is 400 items long, right? This means there's 400 X's and 400 Y's and 400 Z's, but I might want a chunked behavior that's better for caching. So I might want to be able to say, like SOA of 16 vector threes at a time, that's probably not right because that's 48 floats, but whatever. This might mean actually AOSOA, <laughs> where you have 16x, 16y, 16z, then 16 more x, 16 more y, 16 more z. You might want to do that. It's not in the language yet. Like I said, I want real use cases. Whoops, this would be C, not B, right? I want real use cases before I start presuming and building this kind of thing up. But it would be a relatively straightforward extension of what is here already. Um, however, the trick then is that either we need to make SOA pointers fatter so that then an SOA general SOA pointer can like handle all these cases, or your function needs to say I take SOA 16, or you just design your code not so that you don't have to do that and the function knows, uh, you know, because you declared this in the type. So uh, there's things to be worked out, but I think they're workable. Um, someone's asking what is happening if you use using to declare on struct in a, another struct that would hide the name, right? So what if, you know, what if entity had uh, foo, that's some int that's five, and door has foo, that's some int that's six, right? So now this is an error you'll get a redeclaration of foo. And I wanted that. It's also the just the default behavior that happens when you pull one namespace into another. But I wanted that because I'm not sure that shadowing behavior is really the right thing. It's confusing in C++, for example, when you do that. And it often leads to bugs. Um, so, however, uh, a potential future expansion for using is to give qualifiers on the using, right? So let's go back to the very simplest, I'll split screen and go back to the very simplest case. Here, when I was using this enum, right, maybe I could say using things.members except third, right? Or except <coughs> second comma third, right? Or I could say, you know, only first or something, right? Because you want that kind of mechanism, like if I have some math library that redefines like square, but I've got my own square function that I already have, I want to import the math library like without square, and then, you know, maybe I can define my own hook that renames square or something like that, right? Um, you know, or I could say using things.members except second, third, um, I don't know, rename... Uh, first to silly first or something. I don't. I have no idea what the syntax is, but a really robust version of using would let you do all this stuff, right? So, um, so if whoops, if that's the case, then that gives you a robust way to resolve these ambiguities. I don't remember which so many functions here. Anyway, oh, we had foo five, yeah. So I could say using entity SOA entity except foo, right? Um, in this case, then I'm being very explicit about the fact that I'm overriding something and this is the behavior that I want and I'm not doing it by mistake. So that's not a thing that exists in the language right now, but if use cases demand it, we could go there. Someone's asking about references. Dude, references in C++ are just pointers with a different syntax and different defaults. So I would rather have a way to just have one thing and have the default grain of the language be better so that you don't need to pass like references around. So, um, you know, like one of the things that references do for you is like, hey, I have a reference that's equal to some other thing. And you could do that with using as well. Like if using is about renaming things, then you don't need some weird reference to rename things. You just pull the name, right? So, yeah. Why is it that AOS to SOA is possible, but SOA to AOS isn't? Because AOS presumes that all your stuff is packed together in memory 
And in SOA, it's not packed together in memory. So if you were to somehow make an implicit cast from an AOS pointer to an SOA pointer, you'd have to like make a local copy, pull the data, gather the data out of the SOA array into a contiguous place, and then give a pointer to that. And that's slow. And so you don't want something that slow to be an implicit cast, but you can do that explicitly just fine, right? You can make a <coughs> you can make a local version of that struct on the stack and uh, use equals to assign it, and that'll copy all the data, and then you can pass the pointer to that. So if you're going to do something slow, I'd rather you know that it's slow. I don't want to encourage you to do that all the time. Tyler's asking, for casting between SOA and AOS pointers for at passing to functions, wouldn't it be possible to generate two versions of a function at compile time, one for SOA and one for AOS, instead of worrying about casting the pointer? Yes, it would. Absolutely. And you uh, that might be something that we do. Um, if it's required, I'm not even convinced that it's required because, like I said, when you tag the struct AO SOA, then all pointers to it implicitly become SOA, and I don't think you really are going to want to have functions that apply to both, but, but maybe you will. Now the problem is that's combinatoric in a couple of different things. So if your function takes five pointers, and you're just like, I'm going to generate something for every version of this, now you're generating 32 functions. Um, so you get something kind of like C++ template code bloat in that case, and that's not very good. And then the other thing is, well, maybe there's a different kind of pointer, like, well, maybe we have more general, like I said, format of like, you could have SOA and then anything in parentheses. And then I guess if we wanted th that, like there's no way to combinatorically generate all that. So maybe you just make the SOA pointer fatter. I don't know. It's just, it's a thing that has to get thought about, um, but I'm not convinced it's necessary. So we'll just see. Um, oh, but the other thing is, there's other things that you might want to uh, combinatorically generate a function on. We won't go into any of that right now. But then, say there's other something called squishiness, like how squishy something is or not, uh, I want to combinatorically generate. So now I have s the product of the number of squishies and the number of pointers generates. Like it, it gets a combinatoric explosion really fast. Um, Eh. But then maybe maybe instead of that automatically happening by the compiler, you could just have a directive that says, um, you know, uh, like um, I want to call, um, I want to generate print floats in memory of uh, I don't know, like SOA and nothing because that's an int and uh, just some compact notation, and then a like if I explicitly list the ones I want to generate, then maybe that's fine. Um, you could have the compiler only generate the ones that are needed, but what if you're writing a library and somebody might want to call you with a different combination, right? So it, it's <laughs> I mean, if you supply the source code to your library, then you're fine. But if you're supplying binaries, what happens? etc. Yeah, so like Tyler is saying in the follow-up, yes, you could only pre-generate the things that you need, but you need to have source code to do that, for example. It's a, there are limits to what you can do. And so if we can do something better that doesn't have those limits, then we should. So I'm not diving into things that are questionable yet. Would you get an error if you use using inside a struct with a pointer on itself? Yes, you would get that error of a conflicting namespace, first of all, because you're importing the guy's namespace into his own namespace. So you're going to get an error immediately because any element in that namespace, for example, the pointer that you're importing with will conflict. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm looking back. Um, what problems am I having with LLVM? Mainly, I'm just really heavily annoyed by LLVM. Like, 
It's just way bigger and bulkier than it should be, and the human toll in trying to use it is higher than it should be. And so I've actually started making an LLVM backend for the compiler, but I actually pressed pause on that and started doing this stuff because LLVM was like just making my life miserable. And it's probably worse because I'm on Windows. Like LLVM on Linux or something is probably better. But man, I, I don't like it. Maybe as I get more used to it, I'll like it more or something. Um, but they just, yeah. There's like an order of magnitude more files in the project than I think there should be, which means it takes a long time to compile. It just, I have to have this mental map in my head of what all the files are that would be much smaller if there would be many, many fewer files. And um, yeah. That's not to say that LLVM still wouldn't be a good backend in terms of generating good code and whatever. It's just, I don't, I don't enjoy it. It doesn't make my heart sing to start integrating LLVM. Was there a reason why I'm modeling C++ inheritance rather than, for example, Go style interfaces, except I lost. How do I make... Okay, you have to click on the chat to make it not scroll. I have missed the rest of Steven's question. It's here somewhere. Where is it? Okay, yeah. Was there a reason you're modeling C++ style inheritance rather than Go style interfaces? Um, given that I seem to be up in the air, uh, the reason is just that I saw a way to do the C++ thing in a very data-oriented way with minimal cost, and that was great. Um, because I use the C++ way every day, so I know that I have a useful way to do that. Go style interfaces, I'm not really sold on because you can't necessarily do everything with them. And they have a runtime cost when you like compute a new interface and you know, maybe you can pre-compute most of the ones that you really want and whatever, but I'm not convinced that interfaces are the right thing, but I haven't used them. And I especially don't have decades of using them like I do with C++. So um, this is not to say that in inheritance is the right model. In fact, I absolutely don't say that. But what I am saying is, hey, look, here's this inheritance that at least a lot of people are used to using in C++ uh, and or maybe want to use or like using. And here's a way to make your program faster without changing your high-level code. Your high-level code is exactly the same because you've got the same organizational pattern. It's just your storage is different. And that was really cool. And so I wanted to show people, look, you can migrate to this style of programming directly. You can imagine exactly how your current code maps to this new thing. Now, you know, I don't do C Sharp, you know, I don't use Unity, I don't use Go, so I don't have experience in those other departments, but I'm very interested in thinking about using this kind of mechanism or similar data-oriented mechanisms to provide that kind of functionality or something more powerful than any of this that I've talked about, right? So if this, we decide that the standard grain for this language is uh, something much more powerful than inheritance or anything and that these data-oriented features should generate a grain combined to encourage a grain that is very much more powerful, then I'm interested in hearing about that. And if you have ideas about that, then email me at this address, language at techlaw.com. Please do not email me about syntax, but please do email me about powerful ways of organizing your data and expressing how to use data because I'm very interested in those things. Um, can I generate a function that takes this input a struct that is using two interface structs? Yes. So in the code, I only ever said, uh, you know, I only ever said using entity, right? But I could also like using, uh, I think I typed this in some example somewhere, but I could, I could do the equivalent of multiple inheritance, right? Where I'm say using uh, uh, database, right, or whatever. Like, uh, yes, you can inherit from multiple things. That's all part of the generality of this using keyword, and it just works.
Would using be a good way to implement linked lists and avoid using annoying node container objects? Maybe. I mean, you can do intrusive data structures that way relatively easily, yes. So instead of having to, like, if you want to put your linked list node inside your door, like I've got a list of doors, uh, the way you would do that is like list node struct. Sorry, I'm f let me turn off C++ mode. How do I do that? I don't remember. I'll just fight with the indentation. Ah! Um, so, you know, you would just have something like this where you have a list uh, next is a pointer to a list node and I don't know, maybe that's all that you have if it's a relatively efficient list. So, um, but you might want to change this around or something so, or have more data so it's in its own thing. So yeah, you could say using node is a list node um, and it's by value uh, and it's also anonymous, right? So you could just say door.next or whatever. That would work just fine. It's another example of like, you know, using multiple usings. However, don't use linked lists because it's not very data oriented because it means your stuff is scattered all over the heap probably. I mean, you, you could pack it, but even if you pack it, because it's a linked list, you're probably visiting things in random order and that's slow and maybe you don't want to do that. Have I looked at functional programming style for data types for objects? I don't know. Functional programming is a big thing with a lot of ideas in it, so I don't know what you're asking. And this questioner is saying functional programming, at least to me, tends to have a more data-oriented format. I don't agree with that at all. Oh my god. Functional programming languages are tend to be about as far from data-oriented as you can get. Um, so... I disagree with that premise. If anyone knows of any <laughs> data-oriented functional languages that are really data-oriented in a very hardcore way and not just data-oriented because they're mapping an array to another array and copying the damn arrays all the time or something. I think you need heavy side effects to be data-oriented because changing data is the problem that you want to solve. So I, I don't know. Anyway, you can email me here if you want to give me an example of a data-oriented functional language. Um, perhaps this is easy to do, and I'm just not thinking clearly, but is there a way to place an SOA or AOS array into existing memory? Yes, you would just cast the pointer. Like, you can cast a pointer, you know, like you could just say, uh, let me just make a new buffer. I could just say, you know, um, x uh, is uh, an array of 10,000 u8s, right? So that's an array of bytes, right? And then I could say, um, let's say I had my vector 3s or something, right? I could say um, v is going to be some array of SOA vector threes, right? Um, and to do that, I'm going to say I'm casting x dot data to array of SOA vector three. And once I've done that, whoops, I can't type today. Once I've done that, I actually don't need this because the type inference. So I could just say that, right? <clears throat> so that would just work. I'm pretty sure. If it wouldn't work, it would be a compiler bug and it would be made to work. But um, you could also, <clears throat> instead of an array of SOA vector 3, you could also cast to a pointer to SOA vector 3 or whatever. This just works, and then you treat the memory like you want. So, yeah, the, the idea of data orientedness is that you treat data the way that you want to. And so this kind of thing just works. How hard would it be to support a converter so that could be switched on hot reload? I don't remember the details of Casey's converter in Handmade Hero, so I can't speak directly to that right now. But 
It's probably not harder than it is in C, and he did it pretty fast in C. Um, Matt is asking, my, my example was a bit poor, but I mean, if I have a base thing A that has name and age and a base thing B that has name location, will I be able to put using on both of them? Yes, but you'd have to say accept name because you can't pull name from both of them. And I don't, I don't really want that implicit shadowing to happen. I don't think that's good. Um, so you would get a compile time error unless you say accept name on one of those classes. And accept isn't implemented yet, so you can't do it, but you'll be able to do it. How will the compiler support SSE instructions for SOA types? Well, I don't know exactly. Maybe at least with intrinsics, just like in C and C++, but maybe there's a better thing to do. I don't know. Um, does this have any interesting interactions with the owned pointer exclamation point feature? He's talking about the thing where you can say like, you know, um, name, well, no, let's say, uh, let's say an entity, right? Um, I could say this, right? And uh, I can declare that as an owned pointer. If it's not owned, I can type it like that. Um, and then this will go away when I descope. It'll be deallocated from the heap exactly like something on the stack. Um, I haven't, can't type today. I haven't typed this, but um, you probably should be able to have a short syntax for this that lets you use type inference like I mean, this is weird because not equal is an operator, but I don't know. You should be able to do something so that you don't have to type the type. But if you type it the long way like this, um, this will be deallocated. You could put that in a, in a struct, right? And it'll descope with the struct. That works with all the SOA stuff, but it's completely orthogonal. So there's not really any interaction that you need to worry about that I could think of. Uh, maybe that's wrong, but I don't know. I think it's right. Mm. Can I just do anonymous using, as in just using an entity? Um, in a function, you can if you already had the name for it. I guess you mean in a struct. I guess you mean, can I say using entity like that? And you probably will be able to. I just don't support it right now because it it just seemed more useful to me to have a name or not optionally, right? Um, but yeah, in the final language, you could probably do that. Uh, right now, you have to name it, though. So you'd have to say using E entity or something. Is replacing Emacs still on top of my list after the witness? Yes. Damn it, I want a better editor. Is data-oriented a buzzword? You know, I thought very carefully about whether I want to adopt this idea that this is a data-oriented language or whatever, just because whatever oriented just means, oh, this is the next trend or whatever. But damn it, it's a little bit different this time, at least, because data-oriented is a real thing actually grounded in uh, empirical situations, right? It's not... Um, you know, made up fantasy land stuff. So I feel a little bit better about it. Uh, but yeah, I also don't want to, I don't want to ride a hype wave or something, but there should be hype about data orientedness because it's good. So I don't know. <clears throat> Someone's asking about inlining exactly a thing. Person who's asking about inlining, watch the previous demo because I, exactly demoed your question in that demo. Ooh, Steven has a really bad bug. Dude, I will help you debug your really bad bug. 
sometime. I will fly to Germany and help out, even though I'm in crunch on the witness. I don't know what a better, someone's asking what, what does a better editor mean exactly. I don't know, I just want to experiment. <clears throat> All right, any other questions? I've been talking a long time, so I could really take a break right about now. Um, take the last few questions. I like going to Berlin, by the way, because I, I have good time dancing in Berlin, and of course I could eat at white trash fast food and eat at that burger place that's in the shack and all this stuff. So um, I'll go to Berlin any time. It's a little hard to justify right now when I'm trying to ship a game, but you know, you need breaks now and again. Any final questions? Um, okay, there was a comment in the demo that mentioned that this wasn't dynamic dispatch, but it seemed like it to you. Can I clarify how that wasn't dynamic dispatch? The reason is just because this language is not about dynamic dispatch. And so the compiler will make assumptions that you're not dynamically dispatching. So if you, if you like dynamic dispatch means like, oh, I can just change this value and make the dispatch go somewhere else in the middle of my program, right? And no, like maybe you could do that and it would happen to work, but actually the compiler wants to be fast. And so it's going to, make whatever assumptions it needs in order to be fast, including not giving a crap if you change that value that determines how the pointer gets generated or something, right? So the intended meaning for that pointer unpacking is the very low level idea that once you've set that value, it'll never change. So, um, and m maybe there's a way we can formalize that better in the language. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not meant for like, hey, iterate in a loop and increment that value which causes the pointer to be unpacked differently every time you ask for door dot position. That's, that is a crazy town where I don't really want to go. However, I think that this version of it, the very limited disciplined version of it, is very useful. My favorite ice cream flavor is vanilla bean followed closely by a really high quality like peppermint flavor. What is the best way to control which members stay together versus which are separated? Well, if you really, like I said, if you really care, then you want those things to be in different places in memory. So doing that entity hot versus entity cold thing that I did is probably what you want to do. But there might be uh, some language features that we might want to add for more nuanced control over that. We'll see. <clears throat> yeah, read only. Um, I'm a big believer in being able to declare things read only. Like you should just be able to say read only on a member variable. Um, but then I also don't want to force you to have to set it in a constructor or something unless, like there are no constructors in the language right now aside from the implicit ones that make default values. And the reason is because I don't just, again, want to go copying every other language. That presumes that constructors are the right way to do things. Um, maybe they are, but uh, I want to wait until a little bit later to see if they are, right? Because um, a lot of the need for constructors goes away once you have default values, which we have. So we'll see. Um, is it possible to using static or global classes into the namespace of an instance? It should be. Let's try it. Let's, uh, does this, does this still compile? No, let's not save it. Um, all right, so we're reverting to something that hopefully still runs. Whoops, that's the wrong program. Where is it? Right. Oh, I saved it with this. All right. I saved it with some other junk in it. Oh, because 
This sh sorry, this should have been colon colon five. It's five is not a type. Whatever. Oh, because I <laughs> I raised one of the numbers to something really high. Oh yeah, my A and B array. Look, it's still four hundred. <laughs> All right, so we're back down to some reasonably unchanged program. So let's do an experiment and try this out. Let's move, okay, thin global space, right? So in one of my random tests, like uh, print position test, I should be able to put things.members into this door, right? Actually, let's do one that's also using an entity. Right, so I should be able to say using things.members. I haven't tested this, and this might blow up. Uh, let's see if that compiles, first of all. Um, oh, right, okay. Sorry, you know what? Here's the thing. Like I said, uh, in the same way that you can't do this, you can't do this right now, because every, in a in a struct, it's a relatively minor parsing thing. But in a struct, everything after using is a declaration, and this is a value. And I don't think I don't think that's a sensible. Oh my god! Okay, it compiled. They compiled. Let's uh, let's see what happens. Uh, why the hell did we get what has 60 things why did that have 60 things do I have a weird bug oh no right okay because we just changed this All right I was looking for a 60, but it's 20 times 3. All right, so using, this is, this is a long, uh, this is a long discourse or tangent, but all right, so less output. So I'm going to print something. I'm going to say, make this really easy to find. Boom, and then I'm going to say, Door dot first or third third is percent D. I don't know if that's going to work. Maybe it did. Ha ha ha! It worked. So the answer is yes. You can do that. Uh, the way I did it was a little bit weird, but yes, you can do that. Um, all right. I always I always love it when. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, I think that's it for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for visiting through yet another compiler demo stream. This will be up on you. <coughs> Sorry. This will be up on YouTube. Uh, whoops. Emacs, I hate you. For questions or comments, you can email this language at techla.com with anything but syntax comments. I don't want to hear syntax comments. I do want to hear your wonderful ideas about programming languages. So email me here. Um, let me know what you think. And I'll see you all in the future next time there's a big milestone. The next, I've been trying to put these talks out at about a rate of one a month. This one came a little bit later because it was a huge chunk of work and there was a vacation in there and stuff. Uh, but um, that rate may tail down a little bit because I'm going to be working hard on the witness so we can get it done. So I may not have as much spare time to devote to side projects because my spare time will be channeled toward my main project more than it has been. But we'll see. Maybe I'll just try to do smaller nuggets one a month. Or maybe I'll save up for bigger things. Just uh, things will be ready when they're ready. So thank you once again. And uh, I hope to talk to you. And I hope some other people out there can 
do little videos or little blog postings about what they think. I don't have to be the only person trying to push languages for games forward. I think, I think at this point, even with this specific language, there's been enough ideas put forth and enough alternative ways that you could think about approaching the same problems that there's plenty of fertile ground for other people to say, no, I want to take it this way or I want to take it that way. And so I think it'd be cool if there was like more general discussion about these topics. Um, but thank you and good night.